Consecration from the fiction. Sometimes it's easier to make the fiction. Now I can run. Now I can't hide. The beans are beside down deep inside. There is no pain that can be swallowed. There is no boot that can be followed. Wonderful. Look at that. Another week is here, and we are here for our Tuesday lunch hour, Kill Your Addiction show. I'm here with my co-host George Drukes, and Hi. my name, oh, <laughs> and my name is Maria Powell. I'm the best selling author of Kill Your Addiction Before It Kills You. And um, three other number one international bestsellers. I'm also the director of Coaching with Substance along with George. And today we have a very, very special guest. We have the founder and the creator of the Sober and Serious Facebook group with 22,000 plus strong members of people that are really serious about their recovery. And we have Keith Campbell here today with us. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm perfect. I have been uh, trolling. No, no, I shouldn't say trolling. <laughs> I've been going through the uh, troll as in T-R-A-W-L-I-N-G, not trolling. Um, I've been going through the sober and serious um, group, and me and George are very impressed with that group. There are a lot of people that are really serious about their recovery, really serious about staying clean and sober. And I did not know that you were the actual creator of the group. So, yeah, tell us, tell us about a bit about you, and 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 I'm sure at some point you'll tell us about how you created the group. Sure. Um, I can do a run through my story quick. Um, so basically, like everyone else, usually that has an addiction or alcoholism problem, I got started with a young addict. I don't know, 10 or 12, I can't remember. Probably I would say my first drink was before, was probably around age 10, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, that's really young. Yeah, and um, so, you know, I did that, and uh, when I was 12 years old, my mom died of cancer. Yeah. And so, I was already kind of a, I, was, I wasn't kind of a, I was already a really bad kid before that even happened, and then that happened, and then um, I got worse, and I kind of shut down and built a wall around my emotions, and I, you know, I, I pretty much got, I was stuck in a place of either not believing in a God or or hating God, you know, for many years mm -hmm. after that. Um, and, you know, at about the age of 13 or 14, I started, um, I was, got deep into uh, smoking weed. I, and I was there, one of other things, and drinking here and there. But for, at that time, the main thing I did was start smoking weed. And I was smoking so much that at that age, within probably six months, I had to start selling it just to uh, support my habit. Wow. And so all through high school, which was until the very end, ended up getting, uh, ended up getting expelled or something for fighting. I'm pretty sure that's what it was because that's pretty much what I did all the time. And then uh, ended up getting my GD in jail. And oh, uh, yeah. Finishing high school. <laughs> got involved with a lot of the bad people and um you know so like i said i was selling selling drugs and you know the other dealers and gang members and all that stuff in clubs and kind of noticed that i was pretty good at collecting money for myself so they would sort of hire me to collect money for them too and uh -oh. so i would do that and, um, i would party and I did pretty much anything and everything mm. um, under the sun. A lot, a lot of years of partying, um, and you know, I I would get locked up, go in and out of jail, and workhouses and treatment and uh, prison. So you know, and I I had a, my first kid at a really young age, and that mellowed me out for just a little bit, but not too long. And then I was back to back to that lifestyle, pretty hardcore. And, 
you know, I ended up, uh, you know, I would go in and out of jails and prison and when I, you know, and I would try to get sober on my own or, you know, but I really thought like alcohol was my problem or, yeah. or a specific drug and I would just kind of stop doing that and do a different one, you know. Uh, um, yes. I never really, never knew that my thinking was my problem. I always figured it was the drugs or the alcohol or whatever at that time. So that's what I did. And then, um, Basically, so when I was sick, I was sitting at this last time that I had spent over seven years of my life locked up total between all the jail time, prison time, workhouses, and, and all that stuff. And I have four kids' moms now, too. So when my fourth kid's mom was pregnant with my fourth kid, wow. I had realized I was a, a real crappy dad in that, you know, that I... I I was not happy with the person I was and I'd had a lot of pain and I, you know, towards the end, I, last two years, I got really bad into my stuff, which I never do. And, you know, and I got really bad and got to the point where I was either going to kill somebody and get locked up for the rest of my life or, or get killed. Cause I, I really didn't care about anything anymore. And, and then there was a moment, you know, I just broke down on the parking lot and I was like, I'm done with this life. I'm sick and tired of it. And that's when I put myself into inpatient treatment and, um, was serious about it. And I got out and I, changed my number mm. and I got and I deleted the numbers of everybody that I sold to and bought from and party with and um, instead of having like 600 and some numbers in my phone I had two the only two people besides my family members that I knew that were sober and reached out to them and you know I was like you gotta show me you gotta show me what to do like I don't know I've tried this on my own you know and I, out of all the things I'd accomplished in my life because even when I was bad I was accomplishing things I mean even not always in good ways but I mean I had mansions and stuff that I had lived in and mansions stuff, and I mean, yeah I was growing weed for a long time so my electric bills are like 550 a month so I had to have big houses so the electric company wouldn't raise their eye on me and <laughs> wow <laughs> so, yeah. wow was, oh yep yeah Sometimes I had more than one home at a time, and I would just let friends live there. And yeah, I was always doing something, but it was usually no good. Once in a while, I would have a job for a cover or something just to do that. But mm. my lifestyle was pretty crazy, and you know, I travel all over the country and do all kinds of stuff, and I knew a lot of people, and you know, so my life was pretty much the ideal bad guy you know kind of like something you see out of the movie except you know i was actually really you know i was always a nice person but i did bad things you know and i always thought maybe i'm just a bad person and i deserve this life and that you know i'm just destined to go in and out of jail for the rest of my life so i just had to deal with it and whatever but there came that point where i said where i just had enough and I was willing to do whatever it took, and I knew that I didn't know what that was because I had tried everything that I thought I could do and, you know, tried white knuckling it and all that stuff. So yeah, I did all that. I got out, and I, like I said, I got out of treatment, and I knew that that wasn't the end, and I wasn't cured, and that I needed to do something. So I got involved, um, started going to meetings, and I got a sponsor right away, and started working the steps and within three I would say three months of being in recovery I I was getting added to a bunch of these groups on Facebook and stuff that were uh you know sober groups and they were cool and stuff but I just felt like there's something missing and you know I really wanted people to be able to feel connected and feel supported yeah you know so what I did was I told some people I mean you know I'm set up and I'll start my own sober and a couple of people were like, that's awesome. And a couple of people laughed at me and uh -huh. said, yeah, right, whatever. There's already a bunch of bullets. I said, ah, yeah, but there's something missing, you know. And so what I did was I, I did start one. Um, I started it with like 200, 200 members. And that was a little over, I would say, that was around three years and three months from now. How? So, how does yeah how did you 
That's amazing. Well, first of all, Keith, I'd like to um, share with you that we've got George, my co-host here and, and my partner, and he also um, shares the, the, mar the marijuana or the pot addiction um, piece with you. So maybe there's some aspects there that you guys can talk about that I don't quite understand because I was never really addicted to pot. I had other things that I was addicted to. Did you want to? Yeah, I was going to say his story sounds very um, familiar. Um, I didn't get into it all that early, but yeah, so I wasn't, I was 18 before I even really started smoking weed. I could have had it a couple of times before, but um, when I was in high school and stuff before that, I guess I, I knew a couple of people that did sort of do it. So I was the guy that all the seniors came to to get their weed sort of back for a little bit there. But, um, yeah, it wasn't until I was 18 and I started smoking it and that kind of ended up, you know, I don't think I was, I was kind of on the same league you were, but, yeah, I definitely got no involved. No No, no mansions in my world. <laughs> um, lived with mum for a long time and, yeah, but um, I had a couple of friends that were pretty, you know, dealt a, a fair bit of weed for, you know, my town standard and, um, yeah, kind of there was a couple of guys that owed sort of the guy that I went to a few dollars sort of thing. So me and a few of his friends sort of went around and collected basically the money that he was owed. So that sort of spiralled into a few, you know, let's go and collect for him and then for another guy and yeah we sort of done it for about three different guys and that kind of dawned on me eventually the one of the guys we weren't actually collecting for what he actually was owed we were collecting because he didn't like the people you know and that just sort of you were just doing home invasions was what it really came to then and so yeah that that wasn't cool um I I never got caught or I was you know, I never never done any time or anything like that. But yeah, it was definitely a you know a pretty big eye opener, I suppose, into what could have been sort of thing. Like I know I've had a friend do a bit of time for exactly that, like what they call home invasions now. And yeah, that was a pretty silly story. So. But um, yeah, so like, how did to like please elaborate? Like, you went from dealing a bit of weed in high school to you know, obviously, it sounds like you were growing and you know, running a few grow houses and stuff like that. Like, how did that come about? Like, well, I mean, it's so high school, I was already selling lots of pounds. I, I went. Um, I got became big time pretty fast and was you know running out to big time people's places and you know pick, picking up pounds out of freezers and I mean I I had so much money in my wallet as a high school kid that I was like basically leaning sideways in my desk because of, you know I, was like, I had to take my wallet out of my pocket otherwise it hurt to even try to sit down yeah. and then I really was like I don't need school you know what I mean like what do I need I make more money than any of these. You know, my, the teachers would have been. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My dad, my dad had a business too, and I thought, well, if I ever need to, I'll just work risk business too. Like I don't need this school, or you know, my I in and out of high school. I mean, I didn't really do homework. I just would leave with you know three of the pretty girls from school uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and stuff like that. And then if I had you know business to do, I would drop them off and go do that. Um, that's pretty much what happened, and I and I did that for a long time, and um, I eventually moved to California and uh, learned learned some little tricks and stuff for the growing and stuff for from some friends down there, and came back here and started doing that, and, uh, and I did that for probably about six years without getting caught, which was very lucky, but. You know, and, and continuing to sell, and I, you know, I was really lucky that I never got caught doing that because all my friends did, you know. But 
uh, you know, well, when I was sitting in prison, I kind of looked around at everybody and how much time they got and how much money they could make for what they did. And I, I realized that growing weed was, you know, not a lot of time that I could get if I got caught, but I could make a lot of money. So I was, so I was, I was and I loved weed. So loved, weed was like my crutch. That was my baby. Like I said, I did everything, but like I did, I smoked weed nonstop all day long, you know, until towards the very end when I was doing meth and, you know, just smoking weed once in a while, huh. along with whatever other drug I could get my hands on. <laughs> oh, wow. And walk me through, Keith, how the group just sparked 200 people in three years to 22,000. Like I've been stuck, you know, I've been, I've got all these groups and I can never get past a couple of hundred. How, how did it, um, how did it organically? 22,000 members is a lot. <laughs> yeah. dude. Did you advertise? What's your, what's your well, secret? Yeah, exactly. How did it build a movement? To, to be honest, it really was word of mouth, you know, and I was really uh, adamant about, you know, going on there every day and making my posts and, you know, talking to people and doing my best to make people feel welcome and doing my best to, uh, to you know, as, <laughs> coordinate any way I could help people with jobs or places to live because we all struggle with all these things that aren't just the drugs, you know, like, you know, most of us are felons and this and that. So we have that struggle of trying to find places to live. And, you know, there's all kinds of other struggles, you know, people get abused or whatever. And, and, and now it's like, there's so many people that have so many resources and mm. it ended up getting really big. So I ended up needing to get some admins to help me out, you know, because once in a while there'll be somebody on there that goes on there just to mess with people and they don't have nothing better to do in life. And we have to end up blocking them off, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah stuff like that but for the most part like you know there's a, i've heard so many stories of people that i've met that you know they're just like oh your posts or you know that group saved my life and this and that you know it's really cool to hear you know i know that it's not the group you know that it's them and you know god or whatever i power they have that's really and doing the work but you know it is definitely a tool and you know like i mean i've heard some good stories people who are reunited with family members or they get in the group and they see that so and so that they've known forever is sober too, and then they get to reunite with them. And you know, I've watched people go from not knowing what to do to you know getting advice from or experiences shared by people in the group, and next thing you know, they're you know I get to see them a year year or two later, and, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're mm. doing well. And you know, it's 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 a beautiful thing for sure. For sure, like definitely a lot of people interacting, like, you know, someone will post something and there'll be like 250 comments at least of people supporting um, all these people in recovery. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I added some admins and I got a pretty good admin team now, you know, and they're, they're on it too, you know, when I'm busy and I can't be on there. I know a lot of them are on there and they're monitoring stuff. But if people need help, they need help. Or if something crazy is going, going on, then they can take care of that. I love it. Yeah. That's why I was surprised when, um, you know, when you posted, you know, if you if you need help with recovery and you just posted your number, I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to get back. <laughs> I didn't know you were the one that, that started the group. That's fantastic. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So um, what are the things that, how has sober and serious helped you specifically with your own journey to recovery. You know, that's a crazy story because I think about that all the time and it's it's definitely 110% helped me, you know, because waking up knowing that I'm going to make these posts and then, so I make these posts, but then I see these other posts and, you know, that other people are posts. And so it's, recovery is like the first thing I think about and when I wake up and the last thing I think about before I go to bed. And a lot of it has to do with that group because, you know, like I said, I was, you know, pretty adamant at doing my morning posts every morning. And for a very long time I did. And, um, 
you know, I'd do a morning post on my regular Facebook page and I'd do a morning post on the Sober and Serious page and I'd try to be as inspiring and helpful as I could, you know, kind of whatever was going on in my head that day, you know, and I, I got really busy and I haven't done that all the time. I still usually will post something once a day, but that's not probably as good as the stuff was as I was posting in the beginning, but you know, um, it's, it's helped me. It's helped keep me accountable too. you know, being that, you know, I run that group, people look up to me for advice and for, you know, wisdom or, you know, uh, guidance and stuff like that, which, you know, I definitely don't have all the answers and I, mm. you know, not a guru or anything. I definitely do try to learn and, and grow and get better and, and stuff. And I mean, in every way I can, mm. but on that, I now I never know anything, but I, I do direct people sometimes if there's stuff that I don't know, or if I feel that my experience can't help them, I, there's always somebody that I do know that experience could help them or you know who might have you know better advice for them on a certain situation exactly because i know george that you've never really joined any of these recovery groups until you met me yeah well <laughs> i still haven't really other than sober and serious so. yeah so what do you think of the interaction in there as someone that's newly recovered how do you think it'll help someone to be there do you find inspiration and I, I know you like a lot of the posts there I see yeah well I I really yeah, I see a lot of the stuff there that I can relate to and stuff that I feel sort of thing you know and I yeah, can't help but just give it a quick like or a love or um, whatever I you know <laughs> I like to sort of try to help people where I can I guess and kind of what I'm about um, but I'm in the same boat, I guess, as Keith. I don't have all the answers. Um, I would, lucky I, I could just, you know, I just <laughs> decided, well, with a little bit of help from you, decided to stop sort of thing. And, yeah, coming up on six months now of Yay. being clean and sober. And yeah. Yeah. You go, go, huh? got to keep trying, man. That's all it is. Just keep swinging. Um, yeah. Like, even you can't sort of you know even when people offer you a drink or the you know for a smoke it's kind of <laughs> still sort of a bit weird for me to like turn it down you know i, I feel like oh that's a bit rude but do a double take and go yeah. well, it was my birthday the other day on the weekend and i'm like oh let's have a drink as a joke and it's like nah <laughs> no we'll just have like a dessert a monster dessert at the at this dessert place and and things like that and you know what we save a lot of money not you know we didn't that though right? <laughs> yeah it's a really expensive restaurant <laughs> yeah. but but overall though it, it does you know there's there's a lot of benefits to being sober and being serious about it. What are, what are some of the benefits in your life, um, Keith, having turned sober? What's your sober date? Um, March 3rd, March 5th of 2015. So it's been about two and a half years for me. Oh, okay. Um, so was there a slip yeah. up when the... Three, three and a half years for me, sorry. Uh-huh. Um, oh, of course, there wasn't a slip up. That's when you started the no. group since I ever I mean like I said back before when I was trying to be sober on my own like I definitely couldn't do it but the summer since like I got into the fellowship of all these people and I started working till 12 steps and had a sponsor and like you know um staying getting involved and in all these events and all that stuff and different meetings and everything I, I haven't had any slips no I haven't and I don't think about it either i pretty much have that door closed you know like if, if shit gets really bad then I'll, I'll talk to people that i know and i will you know um use the tools that i've learned through working with steps and you know or you know with the connection i have with my higher power today that you know like i don't i haven't had that happen yet you know like i mean really bad stuff has happened and since i've been in recovery and I haven't had the thought of why I want to go drink or use and yeah. I have maybe thought well I 
love to blow up a building or something right now. But, <laughs> 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 now we all. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I have to give credit to the 12 steps because if I wouldn't have worked them, I, I don't think there's absolutely any way that that would have happened. Yeah. Do you find also that? Huh? Do you find also that being you know, well, a the founder, but be part of the group that that kind of keeps you a little bit honest as well. Um, I know for me, yeah. sort of doing this show is one of the things I sort of thought. Well. Yeah, because a lot of people that know me and anyone that's potentially going to be listening into the show is just going to be shaking their head and saying, no, I know George for a long time and he <laughs> smoked a lot of weed. He ain't just going to stop. Um, and hell, I told that to a lot of people that, you know, the only way to sort of get me to stop smoking weed was put me in the ground. And, um, but I find that doing this show, I've I've got to be straight up about it you know i i find that that's helping me to to not you know do it anymore sort of thing like does that like do you find the same thing that being part of sober and serious has that sort of helped you as far as you know wanting to smoke weed again or anything like that or I mean, it helps me for sure. I mean, everybody keeps me accountable. If I if I make one little mistake, if I say one thing, people are on my case board immediately. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got to. I, I have to make a public <laughs> amends. You know, usually uh. it happens once in a while. You know, and I and I know that being and you know, I never asked to really be in the spotlight. My goal is just to help people you know what i mean and, and be the help most helpful i could but it ends up that i kind of am in the spotlight now which no matter what i try that's just the way it is and people are you know looking where where a lot of people tell me they love me and like me and i believe that there's also a lot of people that for some reason don't like me and are looking for any reason to say anything and would love to see me relapse you know but like I'm not, oh, um, no. like I said, I close that door and I don't leave it open. People that know me from the past, like on my regular Facebook or some people that I know from my past that are sober now, like they, I'm the last person they ever expected to get sober and it's kind of a crazy thing. And to go from being, you know, that person I was to actually being, you know, going to college and, and actually working for a treatment center now, like, blows their mind. And, they, they, you know, I ask them once in a while, I'm like, what would you say if four years ago or five years ago or whatever, if somebody told you I'd be working for a treatment center and they laugh. <laughs> well, before we go any further, we've just got a lot of your friends um, doing shout outs. We've got Beth. Herndon and from Minnesota shouting out to you. We've got um, and she said that definitely Sober and Serious is a positive and great network. Um, we've got Aaron Langbane, uh, got Amy L Loga. I've watched Keith and his post for two years and because of all the positives I saw with Keith and the others, I wanted what they had. Here I am one and a half years later, still sober. Much love to yeah, you, Amy, Keith. Amy, Amy. Jamie, who is her boyfriend, used to use together. And oh. on my three years, I was able to give them their their one year. So when, when I got the same day of my two year, they decided to get sober, and, and um, they said they were watching my posts and stuff for that whole time. You know, and, oh. and they said you know, that I inspired them, and I'm sure that watching me, because knowing how I was, because they were there right with me, like. You know, you know, actually doing this thing gave them hope, but really, like they're they're doing it. You know, they get yeah. the, they they should get the credit. You know what I mean? I'm just happy to see them. You know, get better, and you know, I, I, I there's nothing more, nothing I like more than to watch that call happen for somebody else today. You know. Nice. That's. Can you imagine you using with people? now george and then they 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 join your bandwagon how good would that be well <laughs> i was like no i can't imagine using people now no no i mean <laughs> them joining your bandwagon and then you um, know i i guess i don't want to sort of i probably that would spin me out a little bit i don't know about the whole would people follow me along that road um 
hell if I can inspire anyone to give up anything like that. You know, more power to you guys. I'm, I'm glad I could do that. But yeah, I I kind of don't know if I would sort of thing. Like, I don't know if anyone's going to quit doing anything, you know, bad because I sort of stopped smoking weed and stopped drinking booze. Uh, but I think you'll be surprised, right, Keith? We all think that we can't uh, inspire someone, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, like your story is different, but I've seen a lot of people help, and if nothing else, you don't even have to really say anything. You just plant the seed of hope. You know, like for me, it's probably a little different because people are like, if that crazy dude can get sober, I can. <laughs> anybody can. Yeah. You know? So. <laughs> Like well, a lot of people yeah. reach out to me, you know, and that's where, you know, working for this treatment center comes in handy. And, you know, if I once in a while will get somebody into the treatment center that I work for or, you know, the majority of the time I actually place them in places other than the one I work in, which is so I work for a Boca Recovery Center and they allow me to place people in other treatment centers. They say help yeah. everybody. So that's the only, so that's why I work for them. You know, that they're they're an amazing company. Um, they specialize in mental health and uh, you know a lot of treatment centers say that they do that, but they really do and you know they even do DBT classes and stuff in treatment and it's it's an amazing program. But they also, like I said, allow me, they want me to help everyone. They want me to, you know, they help connect me with resources that I didn't have and for helping people in ways that I didn't know how to help them before. And, and that has absolutely nothing to do with making any money for the company whatsoever. It's just everybody in that company, all the way up to the top owners, partners, workers, everybody's in recovery. So their heart's in it. Mm, you know, and like, it doesn't even feel like I'm working. Like, I, I would do this for free. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I was. You know what I mean? So, like, my life, I'm blessed. Like, from going to what I was doing before to doing what I'm doing now, like, my life is, I couldn't even have dreamed up a better life. So, like, I'm completely grateful and blessed for recovery, you know. Like, the Sober and Serious group that I created definitely plays a huge role in it. And, you know, there's people all over the country, like you guys, that are in it now. But 70% of us, of us, our members, I would say, are right here in Minnesota, which is just the state, which is just insane. Wow, look at that. To think of, to think of how many people, you know, I mean, it's growing. You know, there's going to be a lot of people everywhere, but there's, I mean, just an amazing amount, you know, over 10,000, you know, people just in the state that are members of that group. Exactly. And, you know, people are starting to really realize that drinking too much and partying too much and um, wasting resources in our organs and our body and, and, and you know what, the mindless conversations in the pubs and the clubs and buying all sorts of clothes and makeup and heels and shoes and bags just to go out and get hammered. I mean, this is the lifestyle of, of addiction and people are starting to realize that's probably not the way to live life. Is that right? right? Yeah, and, and, yeah, exactly. And I think with people like us, like really like, refusing to be anonymous about recovery and like you know standing up and saying hey you know i'm in recovery and and it's possible and and i'm not boring and i'm and i'm you know i have a fun life i have a good life and like it's becoming more of a glamorous thing i mean recovery like being sober or clean or whatever you want to call it is like the new cool now you know and it's being a lot kind of like almost glamorized it's not being looked down on you know i'm not looked at like i'm a dork or a geek or anything <laughs> like people, people well, are like you know giving me props you know and they're proud of me exactly and, i know, mean a lot of people are following yeah I'm sick of that life that life that life's no fun i mean doing the same thing over and over again you know i call it the treadmill to nowhere because every week it's the same thing you know and you're expecting something good to happen but you know that never happens and if it does you forget it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you waste so much money like an average trip it will george doesn't go clubbing but an average trip to the nightclub nowadays is a couple of hundred dollars for what you're in this dark room with thumping music. You can't even have a 
decent conversation. Why do we do this? You know? Yeah, it's crazy. I used to spend 200 to $600 a night when I would go out and I was, had to buy everything for everybody. And I would, you know, usually get drugs too, because drinking just wasn't enough for me. And I never wanted the party to have. And I would buy drinks for people. I'd buy drugs and give them away to people. And, and you, you know, don't even know these people. Do you have like a deep and meaningful relationship with any of these people? You don't even know their problems. You don't even know their birthday. You don't even know their family life. But it's just a, a keeping up with appearances, isn't it? Well, that was it. I wanted to be the big shot, you know what I mean? And people called me the king. And, Ooh. you know, then and that's the, that started going in my head. And I started calling myself that, you know, wearing wow. fur coats and <laughs> running around. <laughs> going all you Hefna on. You, you got your mansion? Did you have your Playboy bunnies? <laughs> I actually, when I had those, I was in a serious relationship with a young, beautiful blonde, one of my kids' moms, actually. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really into that at that time. But anytime I was single, I was, yeah, it was all about the... Wow. Part. And and you did say, which is pretty intense, you did say that you had four kids to different mothers. Is that, did I hear that right? Kids, four different moms, yeah. And and I guess all of that is in a in a in a in a pot smoking cult, like you know that you were smoking pot, you were drinking. The mansions were there. That is from that. Is there any um, children from you sober? No. No. Would you like? Is that still in your? Uh, are you are you in a relationship now, Keith? I am not in a relationship. I would love to get married, and if my future wife decides that she wants a kid and doesn't already have one or something, I would. It would be something I would be interested in. You know, I've always wanted to have a family, but that's just not the way things worked out for me. Wow. Um, you know, and I, right now I'm trying to be the best dad I can be, but I got a lot of work to do in that area because I really don't know what to do. You know what I mean? And okay. I have these relationships that I didn't have you know, for all them years, you know, so it's hard to get that back. And that's, a, that's a constant struggle. It's hard. It's another reason why I need, you know, the people and the fellowship of this recovery thing and the, and the program and the tools and stuff to, to be able to find peace with all that too. And know that, you know, it's the way it is because of the way I was and I have to deal with that and, you know, and, and things will get better in time, but it takes work. You know, we dig ourselves pretty, pretty big holes, you know, especially me when you're living that kind of life and, you know, I'm still climbing out, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. one wrong at a time, you know? So. Yeah. Do you have a good relationship with all of your kids now? No, I do not. Uh, my youngest kid, who I've actually been sober since before the day he's born, his mom's not let me see him, and I have to take her back to court. You know, which she's just not because she's mad because I broke up with her, which, or she's mad from the way I treated her when I was using. I don't know what it is, but you know, she's just. I mean, I left her four days before I left treatment because I knew she was going to continue to drink and stuff, and that I couldn't have that if I was going to walk this path I'm walking now. You know what I mean? Because I, I was going to be serious and I was going to do whatever it took, and if that meant doing that, that's what I would do, and that's what I ended up having to do. And, you know, I don't know if she's got some resentments because of that or because of the way I treated her in the past or both or what, but for some reason she's not letting me see my kids. So something that, you know, I'm going to have to deal with again. You know? Yeah. How old are your children from from order of, um, like, the oldest to the youngest? My oldest son will be 20 years old on the 27th of this month. And then I have a daughter who just turned 17 yesterday. Oh, wow. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I also have a 3-year-old son. Oh, just before you turned sober. Yeah, he was born, um, so let's see, March 5th was my sober date when I said second, the second day I was in treatment because the first day I was smoking weed on the way in there. Um, <laughs> So March 5th is my sober date, and my son was born April 7th. So Wow. The next, yeah. 
Yeah, got it, got it. Perfect, perfect. So we're in Australia, right? So uh, it's it's pretty much a drinking culture. So someone's yeah. doing the, the clubbing, maybe the pubbing. They could be a tradesperson. They could be a functioning, a highly functioning um, drinker. How does one reach out to these people that think this is the culture? What, what can we do? Do we just share with them about the sober and serious community? And and what what are the steps that you did to gain traction and get twenty two thousand people in your tribe? Um, you know, the whole thing is is out there. Um, the people are really they're going to do what they want to do. You know, they're not going to get sober because someone tells them to, and, mm -hmm. and they're going to they're going to have to want it. And you know, it's kind of an attraction thing you know like i mean if they start seeing you doing really well in life then that's kind of what they they look at you know like if they seen how like crappy they see how crappy my life was and how it is now you know that's that's basically what when they want to get better and um it's not just me though i mean it's like with this group it's everybody you know what i mean and it's you know every member plays a big role and they're adding their friends and like it's it's you know like everybody says my group they're like your group i'm like that's it's our group you know what i mean yeah. because without all these members there wouldn't be a group you know but sure. you know, without the, and the members they do a lot you know with the combination of all the members together like they're on there helping people helping each other non-stop all day long like it's just amazing you know so really lucky you know to have such amazing members of the group you know the members are um, unbelievable like they're going out of their way you know just as much as me to help other people on there and you know i, I it's it's a blessing really you know but it's it's a detraction thing you know and all the different events and all the different stuff it's just the word of mouth spreading it yeah you know so yeah. I don't know. Australia is probably not as big, and I can get, you know, the, the, the culture thing. You know, what I mean, like I, I get it because I was, I was raised that way. You know, like by, you know, and everybody around me were partiers, and you know, my dad was a biker. And, you know, I, 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 you know, my mom was Italian, and their family, and they both sides of my family drank, and all the neighbors. And, you know my friends and their families they were all the same thing so it was it's a pretty cultural thing and it was looked at as normal pretty much here too you know but once people start getting once it starts really messing up their life they're going to look at it mm. the fact whether they're going to want to say they're an alcoholic or not that's up to them you know um, and then you know after that then they have to decide they're willing to do whatever it takes to, to get better and that I think comes with different stages because I think you realize you got a problem before you're ready to quit. Mm. And some people are lucky enough to just say, you know what, like my life's going to be better if I'm not doing this and that's fine. But the majority of us need to be put in a really bad place before we're like enough is enough and are willing to do what it takes to, to get better, you know. So if we know someone in addiction, so we're married to an alcoholic and they're, they're a raging alcoholic, maybe there's even violence involved, what's, what is the piece of advice that you would give this woman that's going through the situation? Um, you know, there's clubs for that. I'm sure they probably have them out there too. Like they have like an Al-Anon club, which is for people that have alcoholic um, family members or um, loved ones. And it kind of basically teaches you how to, to deal with that. Um, and and, and the short run of it, I mean, basically, it basically tells you you can't control them and enabling them around is just going to make things worse because it's going to, you know, it's going to make it take longer before they hit the rock bottom. And that's usually what it takes for people to decide they want to get better, you know. Yeah. So by making it easy for them to continue to drink and, and putting up with the stuff that they're doing is usually worse for them. You know, people do it out of love because they love people, but usually they're actually hurting them by hurting them by, you know, 
some of them things, you know what I mean? Like sometimes kicking somebody out or just, you know, not giving them money is, is, <laughs> is the best thing you really can do to them, even though, you know, they're going to hate you for at that moment. And, you know, you're going to feel like you're, you're being mean or whatever, but in reality, hard love is kind of what saves some people in that kind of situation. But, um, those groups are good just so they can connect with people like them. And, you know, they actually do steps and stuff in those kind of groups too. So that, that -hmm. will help them find peace with themselves and also to show them that they can't, or you can't control anyone else and help them find peace with that. Yeah. Anything you'd like to ask? I don't, well, not really. I can't think of anything to ask there. For me personally, I cannot understand how someone can be involved with someone who is going to be violent toward them. Um, I guess that's a guy thing. Um, you know, I would suppose people would say I was a violent guy um, from time to time, but if someone's like whooping my ass i'm getting the hell out of there <laughs> it's just just my personal thing um and to me it's sort of when i see and hear a woman that will allow a guy to do that i just i can't fathom what the hell can they be thinking like why would you allow someone to do that and go back for more um it, it just doesn't seem right to me i don't that doesn't, doesn't sit in my mind. If someone's going to do something bad to me, then, you know, get out of my life sort of thing. I don't have anything to do with them. And hell, people don't even have to do anything violent to me for me to write them out of my life. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to walk out of my life, I'll hold the door open to see you. But play the sort of thing I don't. But I think it's it's a little bit because you're a man, you won't. Yeah, accept that's that. that's what but I mean. It doesn't sit in my from mind. A woman's it has, uh, perspective, though, it's much different than that because they there's a lot of mechanics, there's a lot of psychological kind of background um, things that's happening. Because for every, just remember, for every tormentor, for every person that's. Um, um, for every person that's violent, they need that perfect fit of the receiver. And 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 for the man that gives or perpetrates, there's there's someone that has a victim mentality that matches that. So it's it's pretty much the the, the, the equivalent, you know, because women <laughs> we can't be violent towards other people. So receiving violence is our way of desecrating ourselves. Hell, I've had women walk out on me just because you know, <laughs> they're going overseas or you know, they want to, for the smallest, silliest sort of seeming things to me. Oh, I just, and then yeah. you know, <laughs> if someone's going to swing a punch at me, then I'm not going to hang around and cop another one. Like, Yeah, but know. remember, you've also been through some emotional abuse, so it's the same thing, isn't it? Well, yeah. I kind of, I guess I copped a lot of emotional abuse. So There you go. So that's, that's that. And then the whole time you wanted to help her. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I just get it a bit more, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. It all, it all pretty much stems to being codependent. You know what I mean? People don't want to be alone. And a lot of times people are beating them up. They're telling them you're worthless and nobody else would want to be with you. And, you know, this and that. And, and they start to believe that. Sometimes they actually become addicted to the chaos, whether they say it or not. You know, I've saved a lot of women from getting beat up and they run back to the guy again, you know, right after that. I mean, wow. it's like, <laughs> and, and you go, it's kind of oh no. <laughs> Yeah, and I see it. I know it's coming. You know, I know it's because ninety percent of the time it does. You know, that's why out here there's a lot of uh, shelters and stuff for women specifically like that, where them and their kids can go there and live. You know, like right now, like they could leave there wherever they're at right now, and they'll they'll be there for them. But most of them will try to protect them. You know. Yeah. Because they they don't know anything else. Or let's say the guy that's beating them up is is supporting them you know financially and they don't know they don't know how to support themselves you know what i mean like even if they're working like they don't they don't see a possibility of them even being able to pay rent and stuff the way the economy is now but on their own you know so 
they worry about that, or they just think they're not good enough, you know, and it's, or, it's, a, sad, it's a sad deal. It is, or the man is the one supplying the drugs. Oh, that too, yeah. Right, and then there can be that, that mechanics going on. Um, but my gosh, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the addiction piece. And there is one that I did ask before about the, the sex addiction. Um, why, why do you think that's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger in the field of recovery and addiction? Um, you mean after people get sober or before? Um, with... Um, whether it's before or after, there is a little thing happening at AA, isn't there, that when there's a newbie, you're not allowed to lay hands on them and things like that. Or it, it's a recommended thing that, um, you know, to stay single in recovery because you want to work the steps for yourself. Yeah, and that's kind of, so all that came of from sponsors and treatment centers, basically the idea of staying single for a year oh. um, and, and people as experiences, not, neither one of the programs or that, or I know more than a few programs, but none of the programs actually say to do that. They actually say to stay, they actually say to stay out of people's business when it comes to that. Cause we all struggle in that area, mm. but people take it upon themselves to get involved in it. And the whole thing is, is when you've been have you've had this drug or this alcohol like giving you pleasure for so long and now all of a sudden that cuts off you're looking for other ways to get pleasure so wow. most people are going to run to sex or they're going to get involved into something like gambling or you know something else you know which you know and and it is what it is you know what i mean like it's that's mm. the whole thing you know like they they talk about and they they look down upon like people preying on newcomers you know what i mean and and mm. sometimes people i mean i've seen people fall in love with newcomers and end up marrying them you know what i mean so their intentions are good yeah. and it's fine i've seen things work out really good for that it's it's when people have bad intentions and know that people are vulnerable and they're taking advantage of them and just sleeping with them because they know that they're vulnerable and then Mm -hmm. leaving them hanging or whatever and that's that's where stuff gets looked down upon and, and you know that's not definitely not right but, sure but what do but you, you think can see, you can see people are looking for some other way of pleasuring themselves you know like filling that void you know what i mean yeah. in some way sex you know or money you know what i mean some people become workaholics and it becomes all about money for them too but right. sex and money are usually the two big ones that people will run to you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. and what why do you think it's easy for guys to get caught in that sex addiction um phase uh is it because um and this is when they've just recovered so it, it is just exchanging one because it's not alcohol and it's not drugs they think well then that it, it might be okay isn't it because it it's a bit of a fine line when you first get into this, you think the alcohol and the drugs is your problem. Yeah. You don't, realize yeah. It's your thing. You don't even know what you're thinking. You don't know that until you do a lot of work on yourself and pay attention and listen to other people until you know that it's your thinking. And that's when you work on changing your behaviors and all that stuff. So they don't even know that in right. the beginning. So really, and not to mention, you know, when somebody's, most of us are like 12 years old when we start using drugs or drinking, right? So <laughs> we've never processed, we've never learned how to process our emotions properly after that. So basically when we get sober and clean, like we're still 12 year olds emotionally, like we're wow. still an emotional 12, 12 year old when we come out of treatment because we've never learned how to process our emotions after that age. So, you know, we're, we're children basically when it comes to that. So that's why people with, you know, um, wisdom or knowledge or you know degrees and stuff and this stuff we we look at it differently because we we know that you know but a lot of people don't know that stuff mm. you know what i mean yeah they don't get that so it's a lot easier for me to look at some girl that's coming at me and she's all over me but she's new and and for me to say you know she's really pretty and whatever but i for her best good i should let her work on herself first you know mm, what i mean wow like, that takes a lot of maturity 
because of what I know, and I've yeah. been in that position, but somebody that doesn't know that, or like that thought's not even in their head, like it's just going to happen. Mm. <laughs> you what, know what um, I, mean? I just wanted to ask George a question. What do you think is the difference? Do you think there's a, a big difference in the way you think about addiction to alcohol and pot and then addiction to sex as a man? Um, or you don't even... I, and see you think of it. I don't really understand like behavior. Uh, yeah, well the, the the addiction to sex part. Um hell I guess if you want to I'd probably say yes, I'm addicted to it. I love having sex. It's great. But <laughs> but not with but, eight different women are. Well I guess from where I sort of stand it was you know I'm lucky if I can hold one girlfriend at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> let alone eight at a time sort of thing, you know. It's so there's definitely a, a, a stig there's definitely a difference because as a man, if you have different part like different partners and girls that you can go to for sex, you're 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 classified as a you know, a stud <laughs> as opposed to having a problem. But then that's the way we think about alcohol as well. If you can drink and you're you're the last man standing, you're also a bit of a hero. So it could just be really the, the flawed thinking. And and that's what Keith said, that you don't realise that addiction is not the substance. The substance is just the symptomatic um, uh, consequence of the broken mind. Is that what you mean, Keith? Yes, to me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're. It's it's, a, it's our it's our solution that we you know we use to dealing with our problems. You know, our our emotions. You know, stuff we don't want to feel. You know, we fill that with that, and when when like drugs and alcohol are gone, we we don't want to feel. So we're trying to fill that with something else. You know what I mean? Because we we're not trying to just process through our feelings like we're supposed to. You know? yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we want to cover that up or we want to do whatever. And it has a lot to do with psychological stuff too, like, you know, the sex will and releasing certain endorphins in to the, into the brain, which is the same thing as like drugs, you know, they do that. Um, so, you know, with the synapse and all that stuff in the brain. And so um, basically, I mean, it's, it's like I said, pleasure, you know, it's making you feel that pleasure and it's as close to, that same feeling in the brain that's going to release that you know reward as the drugs and alcohol gave you that you can really get you know that's right and and really like you said it's it's processing that original incident of where the trauma could have come from and until that work is complete or or delved into and processed the right way forgiven all of the things done with it um it still sits there and it can kind of trigger an addiction at any moment couldn't it yeah so i like that you said that because that's that's the that's the core of it all really it's stuff that we don't forgive ourselves for and things we don't forgive other people for it's you, you know and that's that's our problem that's why we're not okay with just being okay you know what i mean that's why we're when we think of the word fun we're adding something else to it because we're not okay with where we're at in our head because we got these things that are running through it constantly whether we realize it or not they're in there you know what i mean and we're, and we're not okay we're not fine with just being who we are and where we are and we're not we don't have that peace and serenity yeah um, and when you get rid of when you can really truly honestly forgive yourself for all the horrible things that you've done to others and all the horrible things that others have done to you that's when you find that peace that's when you find that freedom and that's when you can just be happy yeah which step is that when you do a, a fearless inventory of people that you've hurt step four six. Uh, that step four yeah step four yeah how, um, have you delved that deep into your recovery, George, where you've thought about the people that you could have hurt? Well, you know me, I... You don't hurt anyone. <laughs> well, no, I've hurt people, don't worry about that. I've done some, some really bad shit to people. Um, no, I, 
kind of want to say though, anyone that I have done any physical violence to as well and really earned it. Um, they've done some stupid shit to get themselves in the situation they were in sort of thing for me to react. Um, although I guess there were times where, yeah, I would sort of, you know, I there's probably people that I have hurt that didn't deserve it maybe, but um, yeah, I, I also know when I was doing security, there was sort of guys that were sort of getting beat up or whatever at the pub and I just let the dude beat them up a little longer until I threw them out because I I knew that they were being a dick and yeah, if they, so sorry, I guess, but for my personal thing, yeah, if anyone that I've ever hurt, I think pretty much hurt that, you know, so um, it's never been for something that I've sort of felt that I have to forgive people. Um, and you also know that people that have abused me emotionally and yeah. you know, taken advantage of me, they're going to, it's going to be a cold day in hell before I forgive them, you know. Like, like I say, they've walked out of my life and I've held that door open. Well, that door's well and truly locked shut now. I ain't getting back in, you know. So I, I don't know if that's a bad thing or, and no, I haven't delved that deep into yeah. my sobriety to. Yeah. But it's only been that, six months. Uh, you want the answer to that? Yeah, go. <laughs> So basically, you know, you hold and that anger and stuff in is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. So you're only hurting yourself by not forgiving them. You can forgive someone and you can totally change your, I mean, you don't have to allow them into your life, but you not forgiving them is only hurting you. They could care less. Yeah, well, cool. Um, I, you know, you still hear me talk about my dearly awesome ex that I love to refer to as Moleface, you know, I, oh, no. I can't forever, like, for the rest of my days, I'm never going to forgive that bitch. I don't, think, I, I don't see it in me, you know. It's, but I um, think that's what people need. Um, we're running out of time. We're on the top of the hour. Um, but definitely, Keith, and definitely, George, that is the key. And, you know, in new recovery, six months into, I mean, that's got, that, that may come a year later, that may become, come two years later, but it's definitely when that comes and when you're able to forgive through that, that is the pivotal moment when your recovery goes to the next level. Yep, that's for sure, man. Like, you know, stick with it. I don't know if you work any kind of 12-step program, but if you don't, I that's the only thing that worked for me. I mean, you know, I had... One of my kids' moms, I'm not going to say who, but was pregnant and cheating on me with somebody else while she was pregnant with my kid. And, like, you know, that kind of stuff's hard to forgive. And, like, it, I held that stuff in for years and years and years. It only hurt me. It only ate me up, you know, when I was able to realize that they are just sick in their head and be able to forgive them, you know, that I was able to find freedom there, too. You know what I mean? That's beautiful. Like, it's... <laughs> so I think that's a great way to end the show. You know, if we can find it in our hearts to forgive those that have wronged us and do step four of the AA or the NA process and, and do a fearless inventory of the people we've wronged and vice versa and start forgiving those people, then we're definitely on our way. But that is it. We are on the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much for listening to the show. Thank you, Keith, the founder of Sober and Serious, for gracing your presence in our Kill Your Addiction show. And starting the group. Yes. Good and work on that. Bro. Wonderful job. Uh, we look forward Thanks to... For me. Yeah, we look forward to interacting with Sober and Serious and know that, you know, I'm always putting shout-outs in there because I love everyone's stories and if they want to be on the show. I would welcome them with open arms. And so. if everyone can keep giving Jason a hard time about cigarettes, that's good. Keep that up, guys. <laughs> He'll be on the show again. Put on his Facebook. 
I did. <laughs> All right. Well, we better go though. But um, see you guys another time. Thanks, Key. Bye, George. Thank you. Bye, viewers. Bye. Bye. Yes. Sometimes we just